Uh-huh. 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 Uh
Today, the hyper-glorified, romanticized obsession with competition, advantage, and conflict has made it into almost every facet of our lives. Not only do we declare war against virtually everything that annoys us, the war on drugs, the war on poverty, the war on crime, the war on terrorism, the war on cancer, you name it. We also, apart from the near constant nationalist wars, live in a perpetual state of common war or class war, where we battle each other on a daily basis for unnecessary economic survival and delusions of status. The fact is, something has been set in motion that keeps us all on a multi-level warpath. Something in our psychology and hence sociology is constantly pushing us into justifications of these patterns. And as this episode will argue, that something appears to reside at the very foundation of the socioeconomic condition itself. A foundation which has given rise to an ever-expanding, destructive neuroses, a neuroses clearly characteristic of a culture in decline. This just in, the president has finished an emergency session at the White House, where he announced that the security focus of his administration will be moving away from the global war on terror, instead focusing all available resources against something the administration has deemed a larger threat to U.S. and international security than anything recognized before, nature itself. That's right, Dutch. The newly declared war against nature will be usurping funds from the Department of Homeland Security, effectively replacing it with a new department, the Department of... I think I'm reading this right. Fuck the earth and the science it rode in on. That's correct, Summer. The administration has already appointed a head to this new department, the CEO of Monsanto Corporation, Satan himself. When questioned regarding concerns about a possible conflict of interest of the new appointee, the Obama administration responded, Monsanto's reputation of challenging the vast power of this intolerant bullying force that goes by the terrorist name natural science holds great potential for our victory. We feel if anyone can take down these insurgent laws which restrict our God-given freedom, it is the professional experience of our true Lord and Master, the Prince of Darkness. Uh, we've just been informed that a press conference is now underway with the Pentagon spokesperson answering questions. We now go live to the White House. As the President said earlier, the greatest barrier to U.S. interest has been a constant state of offensive interference by this rogue network. Nature has been forcing its will against our freedom for long enough. Our economy, our values, the American way of life, it's not negotiable. Either nature concedes to our interests and stops terrorizing us with its hatred of our liberty, or we will be forced to destroy it. Next question. Hi, Joe from LA Times. Uh, don't you feel it could be a bad idea to move against a force which has historically never been overcome or even phased by human action? Also, I understand nature has given a set of demands which, if met, would cease many of its counterattacks. Has the administration considered just meeting these demands? Listen, Joe, we don't negotiate with terrorists. And yeah, I've seen nature's demands, full of queer communist propaganda such as balance and sustainability. It even demands that we shut down our infinite growth consumption economy to make way for something where we are to be slaves to some oppressive natural regeneration respect. Listen. I didn't spend 35 years defending this country to have some metaphysical terrorist group with science on its side ruin what has made this nation great. No further questions. When we think of war, we usually think about gun-wielding soldiers, tanks, flamethrowers, fancy medal honors, and other theatrics. Yet when we step outside the theater, digging deeper in our examination of the world around us, we find that war is actually a state of mind, a reaction driven by some type of competitive condition. And if we had to classify the different levels of large-scale competition, we might end up with two broad categories, imperial war and class war. 
Imperial war, otherwise known as national war, is when an aggressor nation decides to invade some other nation justified by some form of perceived threat. Back in the day, this threat often appeared as purely ideological, with religious groups battling it out to make sure they were in good with God. While in the mildly more literate scientific world today, the threat is more often than not pitched as direct to each of us. You know, such as say, a rogue nation getting a nuclear weapon to blow up your grandmother's bingo tournament. Bingo. Or perhaps a crazed, state-funded hijacker crashing a plane into your favorite taco stand. Regardless, in virtually every historical case, the justification for war put forward for public digestion has always been far from the truth. You see, there is indeed always a true threat, but that threat has little to do with the vast majority of the population. Instead, it is a threat that bothers only the highest echelons of the social hierarchy, an elitist upper-class self-preservation based around a loss of broad power and control. I mean, when was the last time the citizenry actually cried out for war? It doesn't happen, only the politicians go for it. And since the establishment would be hard pressed to explain to their citizens that they are going to invade some nation for its natural resources, maintain currency domination, enable freedom for transnational corporations, along with other generally economic concerns to secure the interests of the upper 1%, Various superficial psychological ploys are used instead. The most common today is the moral crusade. We must not tolerate this regime using military force against its own people. Coupled with some basic yet irrational threat of attack. Iran's nuclear and ballistic missile activity poses a real threat, not just to the United States, but to Iran's neighbors and our allies. In the words of famed sociologist Thorsten Veblen, writing from 1917, any warlike enterprise that is hopeful to be entered on must have the moral sanction of the community. It consequently becomes the first concern of the warlike statesman to put this moral force in train for the adventure on which he is bent. You see, a large part of the imperial war is the psychological war against the domestic citizenry itself. The US government spends billions of dollars every year on public relations and recruitment alone, producing signs like this one. For our nation, for us all. Hmm, was it me or does that sound like Orwellian doublespeak? If it's for our nation, then it clearly isn't for us all, as the human species is the closest thing we have to all. And if it's actually referring to all of us in the nation, well, that would be hideously redundant, right? I think what they mean to say in this warm, loving community slogan is, for our nation, screw the rest. Hello, welcome to the show! My name is Pepe, and today I've got something very special for you. A true international delicacy. War! To prepare for war is a very delicate matter. And the first thing we need to do is create some spicy tension to put fire in your belly. So, the first ingredient we need is a well-tempered provocation. Huh? <laughs> Provocations are, of course, seasonal and subject to personal taste. So, may I suggest something along the lines? A marinade golf of Tonkin. <laughs> a robust Pearl Harbor. <laughs> and if you're feeling bored, a bustling 9-11. Then, we let that cook for a bit and prepare our second ingredient over here. <laughs> a special sauté to give life to our fiery dish. The mainstream media. Mm. <laughs> That's it. Mm. Whoa! <laughs> Can you just smell the propaganda and delectable ignorance? After we get a nice sizzle going, we now add our final, more important ingredient. The delicious. Soldiers. Now the most uh, ripe soldiers tend to grow in the more poor rural area of the world, uh, often with limited literacy. Want to pick them around um, 18, 19, because their brains are very immature and quite yummy. <laughs> Perfect for participation in our war meal. And so we mix it all together. Up, oh. Up, thank you. 
<laughs> Perhaps add a few some preservatives like patriotism. <laughs> Not too much. <laughs> Jingoism. And of course, our very special secret tools. Okay, and we are ready. <laughs> the moment you have all been waiting for. Voilà. Uh, I present to you the greatest international delicacy of all time. War. Bon appétit. You know, perhaps one of the most amusing aspects of national war is the circus-like pageantry and ceremonialism. Cute costumes, little hats, shiny pieces of metal, various parades and official posturing, and all adornments and theatrics that give this air of honor and authority. Of course, this is not to dismiss the true sacrifice of those who have given their lives in war, as there are always two sides. This true honor comes from a position of working to help others, not exploit them. And just as we hold the bravery of a firefighter who enters a burning building to save a child in high regard, the intention to help society through military service is indeed a noble gesture. Even though, sadly enough, 99% of those who enter the military with such noble intentions are more often than not being exploited for the criminal purposes of the corporate state. Still, you have to be impressed by this skill to give credence to an idea merely because of the nature of its presentation. In fact, whether it's academia, the news media, government itself, the military or anything else in society, our culture tends to believe and respect people merely because of their presentation, confidence and rhetoric, not the actual meaning or reasoning of the communication itself. Did you know that the first television sets of the 1950s were actually supposed to be used as prosthetic replacement heads to give new hope for those who had been tragically decapitated? But technology, weight, and cord length being what they were at the time, it failed. Luckily, they could play other things besides the faces of the deceased, and TV sets sold nationwide. And it's all true. You know why? Because you heard it from some guy in a tie. In the end, once the traditional, propagandized illusions in defense of the act of organized human murder and resource theft have been overridden, dismissing such shallow justifications as paternalism, honor, and protectionism, we realize that war today is actually an inherent characteristic of the propertied, scarcity-driven business system. Major General Smedley D. Butler, one of the most notable and decorated officers in U.S. history, stated the following with respect to the business of war in 1935. I spent 33 years and four months in active military service, and during that period I spent most of my time as a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I helped make Mexico, and especially Tampico, safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the national city boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the international banking house of Brown Brothers in 1902 through 1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interests in 1916. I helped make Honduras right for the American fruit companies in 1903. In China in 1927, I helped see to it that Standard Oil went on its way unmolested. Looking back on it, I might have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was to operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. So given all of this, it's unique how the general public tends to separate the day-to-day -day competitive business acumen from the severe form of competitive violent warfare, when there's very good evidence to show that they are deeply intermeshed. To gain some perspective on this, we now welcome back our resident guru, Louis the Logic Gremlin. Voila. Ah, before we get into the questions, I do have a letter here that I'd like to read to you and get your opinion on. It reads, Dear Peter, I really enjoy the new show. I think it is helping get these important messages across. 
However, I am disappointed with the crude Louis the Logic Gremlin character as it is just irritating and hideously stupid. Also, would you please stop eating when you are speaking in the show? It's really disgusting and annoying. Rock on, Joe. I'm sorry, Joe. Um, Louie, what do you think about that? <laughs> Totes. Sorry, Joe. Shit stays. All right. So what's the skinny on war, man? Aren't we just crazy animals that have to be in endless conflict with each other due to our biology or something? Okay, I see what you're saying. So you're saying that war is actually a system consequence. Interesting. So, how do we resolve this war tendency then? Gotcha. Well, thank you for your time, Louis. To gain some public consensus on the issue, we now turn live to our East Coast Culture and Decline correspondent, Big Scotty D, who's live in New York City to talk to people about what they think of war. Well, thank you, Peter. I'm here in uh, New York City on a beautiful, cold day, and uh, we're going to try to uh, find some people to maybe talk to... Excuse me, excuse me, ma'am. Would you like to... uh, Excuse me, sir. Sir, would you like to talk about the war? What? Would you like to talk about the war, sir? Um, Would you like to talk about the war today? War? No? Surely, would you like to talk about the war? God bless. No? The war, please? The war? No? Would you like to talk about the war? I'm just sick of this, Peter. You're sending me on these assignments. It's freaking freezing out here. You know, it's like I, I'd rather be in a bar getting drunk, and then maybe I can do this. All right? I think there's a there's a bar up here. Let me just grab my shit. You know, I'm just sick of this. Stop. That's it. I am done, man. I am done. Get some other monkey, okay? There's trash. There's shit all over the place. What does Peter want to know about? He wants to know about the war. Well, I'm sick of it, man. <sighs> I gotta calm down. I just need a drink. Any, any of you uh, Occupy Wall Street types? Woo! Oh, it's not about money. Except when you can't eat. And it's not about foreclosures. Except when you got nowhere to sleep. It's not about elections. Except when they can be bought. And it's not about the wars. Except when they're fought. It's not about the environment, except when we're running out of time. And it's not about my choices, except when they're not mine. It's not the lack of justice, except when you can't fight back. And it's not about the police, unless um you're black. Fuck this shit. So totally ruled by the 1%, which is basically all the corporations wanting to sell us shit and influence us and influence our culture so that we can't even think for ourselves and we're, we're our sense of self is altered and even like our sense of health. And, like, I don't even fucking smoke. I don't know where this come from. Jesus. Peter Joseph has asked us to stand out here in the freezing cold and talk about the difference of classes here, but you know, he's sitting in like his LA loft, like relaxing with like his big, you know, flat screen TV. Yeah, fuck you. <laughs> fuck Peter Joseph. 
Um, the only thing that we don't have is like a, a war on something is, is war on war. And I think that's because like us peace activists, we, we don't want to fight. So we're going to end up losing d due to irony. Final thoughts. How do we think about resolution to something as detrimental as national war when on the micro level, we in society actually praise, reward, and reinforce the same basic underlying competitive drive? Generally, when faced with such a question, people tend to play the morality card, as though a matter of degree is what's relevant, not the philosophical basis itself. And usually this vague distinction is gestured to the effect that competition is good, but we should never go too far and be violent in any way. So then, of course, the question becomes, what constitutes violence? What if, instead of physically attacking you directly, I put you into a subtle yet deeply toxic condition where your life was shortened by decades via heart disease, cancer, mental illness, and other such consequences? Would that be considered violent? And what if such intentions were not even directly malicious, such as a lower class, desperate single mother forced to work three jobs to keep up, who fails one night to provide proper supervision for her child, resulting in the death of her child? I ask you, what is the true origin of the resulting death? And does that qualify as violent? To paraphrase Mahatma Gandhi, poverty is the worst form of violence. You see, the real war going on is not as obvious as many think. The real war exists in the very structure of our society itself. Something public health officials have now termed structural violence. A war, in fact, against public health and balance itself constantly producing casualty after casualty in its hidden oppression, and this form of violence today kills more people than every type of direct behavioral violence put together. Its origin? A social system literally built upon competition and exploitation itself. So for all you noble activists out there, for all of you who pile into protest zones each time a new national war emerges and yell at the top of your lungs, keep in mind that you are only targeting a symptom of a larger sociological problem. And until the activist community realizes this, I'm sorry to say, your protests have no long-term consequence as they do not address the root problem. But on the bright side, it's still great entertainment, right? So let's keep watching this bizarre human experiment. Certainly the greatest yet worst reality show of all time for sure. I'm Peter Joseph, and yes, I like you, am an agent and victim of a culture in decline. Where's the credit scene? What? What do you mean Bob didn't get hurt? I'm sorry, Bob. It's the format of the show. What if what I'm about to tell you makes you question what is what? What if I propose a what if scenario? What if I were to take up precious time in your busy life, just spinning you in a soul dulling spiral with meaningless double talk? But at the same time, what if I kept you distracted with flashy graphics? Would you notice? Or for that matter, would you care? Nah, you're too busy listening to some guy in a tie and sleep.